So, hi, Lucas Matzinger. We've got Lucas on the show. Um, it's been a long time since people have seen you. Uh, how are you, Lucas? Pretty good, Lyndon. Good to, good to catch up and, and finally do like a public talk where we can see what's been happening and, and uh, what I've been up to. Yeah, it's a long time. So for those people that don't know who Lucas is, uh, well, those people that watch Races to Places will definitely know who Lucas is. Um, but I traveled with Lucas from Europe all the way across to Magadan, a pretty big part of my trip. It was the first part of my world trip and uh, we did it together, Lucas. And, you know, that like... It was the start of something huge for me that I didn't know at the time, uh, which was my world travels. And for you, you was, well, getting away from life and, and traveling for a little bit. And you also didn't know how long you was going to go for. Exactly. For me, I, I basically, the only goal I had set was to get to Magadan. Um, so I, I basically kept everything open. But uh, I noticed as we were traveling, as things were going on, I knew right away that Magadan was not going to be the end of it and, and chatting with you more and going through all the things we've been going to having these experiences um, as as I was going on I knew it, I would continue the trip and, and probably do something similar to you where I'm going around the whole world yeah. yeah yeah and it's funny how it started with me and you because we we didn't really know each other uh, until kind of I announced I was going on my world trip or my trip and you were planning to go to Magadan, and it was actually Walter that put us together, yeah, and said exactly. Hey, Walter and our contact at Adventure Spec that that uh, that made the introduction, and I'm I have to say, looking back at it, I'm very very grateful for those guys, and and it turned out into a great uh, team, especially for that first part of the trip where we had both were not that experienced in in round the world travels, <laughs> crossing borders, arranging visas, and everything else. So that for me, that really. Um, it made it a much softer start than it would have been going alone for sure. Yeah. And let's, I mean, we've got so many questions from like my Patreon subscribers and Facebook and Instagram and everything, but we'll come on to yeah. those at the end. We'll first just have a big catch up because we actually haven't spoke to each other that much. We've kept in touch and I think probably quite a few of my followers were following you as well when you were traveling um, mm -hmm. uh, and that ground to a halt we're not going to talk about that right now but we're going to come on to the exact reasons why because I'm sure there's a lot of people wondering um, well what happened to Lucas M you know <laughs> where did he go mm -hmm. uh, so we'll get on to that um, but going back to our travels you know I think when I started the trip 2014 we met up in was it April 2014 or May yeah Early May. exactly April, yeah. April of 2014. Yeah, and um, I had no idea what I was doing. Like, I built a bike, and you did as well. <laughs> and we were just yep. riding our motorcycles through Europe. We went down to Heller's Rally. Um, we did yep. the Heller's Rally. I dislocated my shoulder. Um, you had an unfortunate uh, issue with a friend. You had to fly off home, I think, from that. Um, exactly. Which was, uh, so it was, a, the Heller's Rally for both of us was a bit of a disaster. Um, but we got back on the road and then we went from the Heller's Rally all the way across through the stands and Mongolia and it was just, there's, there's so much we could talk about, but people that haven't seen it should go and check out the Races to Places episodes from the early, uh, the early episodes, right? I think it was season one to season four or five, uh, it was quite a big bunch of episodes right through to Magadan and, uh, so many experiences going through there that it'd be hard to talk about them all here. Trip. So, so we got to, we travelled through Europe, we went through all the stands, uh, we had all kinds of problems. I mean, I remember your bike breaking. I, I had to, because of the visas, I had to travel the first alone. bike breaking many times. Sorry? <laughs> I said yeah. the first bike breaking even more, yes. That yeah, was yeah. certainly uh, so, there were some issues. So everybody's going to want to know about that, the first bike. So why do you say the yeah. first bike? Well... Lucas had two bikes on his trip, so maybe Lucas, you can explain the situation, what happened with the bikes there. So back in the day when 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 I set up my bike in 2013, 14, going for the trip, um, I thought that a 690 Enduro would, would have been the best choice because this was at the time one of the lightest, still powerful single cylinder bikes, uh, fairly reliable. Um, and so I set that up and I actually got a bike from 
from two British guys that rode that bike from Sydney from London to Sydney um, with some with some boat rides in between. But they they did a long trip on it already, so it was set up with some with some overlanding parts with a with a rally rate kit. Mm -hmm. um, and overall, it was a great bike at the time because I was not aware of 690s being modified for modifiable for traveling because mm -hmm. I thought they had no luggage capacity. Um, 690 rallies. Um, I thought they had no luggage capacity until this guy Linden a week before the trip showed some showed some pictures and videos online and immediately sparked the sparked the keen interest and also in some ways envy of me because the 690 rallies are are known since they started racing in the Dakar in 2007 2008 as being even more beastly than a 690 Enduro with more powerful engines being more reliable a bit more simple mechanically um, and with the way you set it up having solved all the problems being pretty much the ultimate bike i couldn't imagine having um, and yeah talking about simplicity this was the main problem i had from the start with my bike was the fuel injection of my 619 duro yeah. um, it actually started the first time at the hellas rally when i had a clogged fuel injector um, and then as we went on the trip, there were more problems with the fuel pump going out yeah. and and the bike giving me a few different problems along the way. Yeah. yeah. So I, I remember, well, there must have been at least five or six issues where we became stranded with your bike. Not all just because it was a 690 Enduro. Some problems I could have had, like the rocker arm issue. I had the same. You had the yeah. rocker arm issue. I can't remember where it was. Tajikistan, maybe. I oh, know it was um, Kazakhstan. It yeah. was in Kazakhstan. Yeah, yeah Kazakhstan. Exactly. Um, uh, and then the stator issue. Yeah, I had a stator issue also on my bike. It's the same stator, so that can happen on any bike. But uh, yeah. definitely the fuel injection related issues kind of got a little bit on a grind on us in the end because it's just constant, yeah. like slowing us down. And um, so most people would be like, oh, you know, fix it, move on, fix it, move on, or sack it off and go home. You were like, sack this bike off and send it home and buy another bike. How did that work? <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, so there was a lucky, very, very lucky coincidence. So as we're traveling along, um, I had kept up a bit with the Adventure Rider, which is the big Adventure Rider forum on the internet that most people listening to this podcast already know. If not, check out advrider.com. Yeah. Um, so through this forum, I had kept in touch with a couple of people, and I knew that one of them was uh, was a guy called Anders Berglund, a Swedish guy that had um, that was an expert living in Mongolia. Um, and I had um, I've heard of him. I knew that he raced in a few rallies. He had a Husaberg rally bike. His brother raced in the actually Anders raced in the Dakar this year, yeah. um, but this was already post the time when uh, when Dakar switched from having an open class where you could ride on 690 to being restricted to 450. Mm -hmm. So I knew that uh, through reading online that Anders had bought a 690 rally that had uh, raced in Rally Mongolia, mm -hmm. but that a Japanese rider had had a really bad accident on that raced in the rally. I think he was one of the leaders. He was a professional motocross racer. Yeah. And then and on day th three or something, he had a really, really bad crash. Yeah. Um, and basically he cartwheeled the bike multiple times, um, ended up, I think in a coma and was in a hospital for a year or something. So really, yeah. really bad crash in the bed. The bike was also fairly damaged, but Anders had start, had bought it and had started repairing it. Um, so as we arrive in Mongolia, uh, you wanted to race Rally Mongolia. Mm -hmm. So I knew that I'd have about two or three weeks. Um, and I saw this bike um, and I looked at it and I was like, so Linden has his Basel bike and I'm really jealous of Basel. <laughs> Because he has all the things that 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 the little things that make it make it better than my bike, um, so I decided on the spot to buy a 690 rally in in Mongolia of all countries, a crash 690 rally, um, and immediately went on on all kinds of KTM websites and hooked up with your contact at at KTM and um, um, with your friend Owen from from mm -hmm. a KTM deal in the UK, mm -hmm. um, ordered all the parts that I thought I would need after getting some mm -hmm. input from you and set about building this bike in Mongolia. So the oh. thing with Mongolia is that infrastructure is not that fantastic, but uh, through our friends that were also racing in Mongolia, we got some contacts and I ended up with uh, with somebody called Daki and Daki was a mechanical engineer that that was a bit of a, um, he he had a setup where in the in the foothills of, of, the, yeah. Mongo of the mountains outside of Ulaanbaatar, 
Um, in in some countries, it would be considered a slum, but it was low, very low cost housing. Basically, he had modified two shipping containers, put them together, and set up a little workshop on the inside. And he had a he had a TIG welder, he had a lathe, and and he was a very um, ingenious person, very good at improvising and and uh, making something, making things work. Because in Mongolia, it's very hard to find parts. It's very hard to get things into the country. It's it's expensive. It takes forever. Yeah. Um, so it was hard to do that. So basically, and then I having went, many pictures from your bikes. Yeah. So basically, I went to S Rally Mongolia, left you with a bunch of photographs and advice about how to modify this 690 Rally into a travel bike, um, waiting for a bunch of things to be delivered from the UK, and off I went racing. And then I came back uh, to find you with, I would say, probably about an 80% finished bike. Which yeah. actually wasn't too bad, considering that it took me a couple of months to build mine in a workshop with everything. Yeah. So we had a few little jobs to finish, and I had a few little things to fix on my bike after Rally Mongolia. So, um, but we got them all finished, and then I believe you was it your cousin that flew in to exactly take, yeah, my so cousin you, Alex. So my cousin, cousin Alex, Alex flew yeah. into the country because he he's he's a very much into motorcycling as well. I kind of started riding off road with him. Um, and he lives in Moscow now. He's he's also Austrian, but he's an expert living in Moscow. Yeah. Um, so basically, I told him, look, I have this 690 Enduro. We're in Mongolia. I can either ship it back from here, or what we could do is team up with Linden, and then we'll ride those bikes. I'll ride the 690 Rally. Yeah. You can ride my 690 Enduro, and we'll ride it, ride it to Lake Baikal in Russia. Mm-hmm. So Alex flew in, uh, and that 80% finished bike was maybe 90 95% finished, but... So we had another two, three days in the workshop, getting everything ready, getting it tested, going for a ride. And then off we set with a fairly untested bike. Um, yeah. We, I think we took a day head start to fix any issues that might come up and parts that might fall off the bike. Yeah. Uh, and then you caught up to us on the on the trip yeah. to Lake yeah. Baikal. And in the end, he took the train back. Was that right? How did he get the bike? No, back? he put he put the bike on the Trans Siberian Railway. Exactly, uh-huh. he put the bike in a in a crate in the Trans Siberian Railway and shipped it back to Moscow where he lives. Mm-hmm. Um, but he took he took a plane back because that's okay. I think it's a week or ten days of, yeah. of riding on the train. So just the bike took yeah. the trip. Yeah. And then we carried on. But it's cheap. Yeah, yeah. It was the by far the cheapest method to ship. I think to to ship the bike from Yakutsk to Moscow, probably six seven thousand kilometers, was maybe two three hundred bucks or something. It's absolutely yeah, super nothing. Cheap. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So then from there we carried on um, with this bike that you didn't really know much about. Um, yeah. And I remember we got to a point where it started using more oil than fuel. Do you remember that? Yes. <laughs> and I remember buying so, like I remember buying like four litre jugs of oil <laughs> to like because exactly. the piston the piston rings were so knackered in this rally bike. Yeah. Um, and we put it through quite a lot as well. I remember there was a few um, in fact, if I can find a photo, I'm going to put it on the screen here. But I remember there, there was one particular water, water hole that you, found, yes. you fell in and you were full submerged, full under the bike. Exactly. I remember it well. And I remember your face when you came out because I bet it was quite cold. <laughs> no, I was up to the, I was in water up to, literally up to my neck and the bike was completely submerged on the water. There was a crossing <laughs> where I wanted to go down and go back up the other hill. It was not very not very far, but the problem was there was a stone I didn't mm. see coming up on the other side. <laughs> Basically, I crashed into the stone, fell over, and the whole bike was submerged on the water, and everything was 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 soaked, not, including me up to here. Not just the bike, you was fully under. Yeah, and me. Like, yeah. Fully, and I don't have it on video. I didn't have my video on, which is a real shame, but I do have a photograph of you standing in it afterwards, so I'll try and find that and put yeah. that in the, the video. Yeah. Uh, then we had all kinds of problems getting the bike started because it had low compression because of the piston rings um, and we eventually, well, we eventually managed to get the bike going uh, by towing it, if you remember, between exactly. water holes. We were just towing it and yes. towing it and towing it because the battery went flat. Um, we, had, we eventually got it going. Um, we also had a problem with the gearbox. <laughs> On it, do you remember the, yep. the idler gear? Was it second gear? Yeah. Um, the idler like basically gear. Basically, I bearing. couldn't put the bike in neutral. Yeah. Yeah. If you put it in neutral, it would just find it's in gear itself because the the bearing yep. on the idler gear was destroyed, so the gear was moving yep. around. So it would catch the dogs and just jump into gear on its own. Exactly. Anyway, 
these, these are all the sorts of things that people say, what a nightmare. But when you look back now after the fact, these are the things that really made the trip because it, it, it made it interesting and challenging and rewarding as well. I agree. We, we got the bikes, both of them, to Magadan despite all those problems. Um, and arriving in Magadan was, was pretty special after, what, four or five months more <laughs> together, um, sure. making our way across there. And then obviously you had to spend quite some time working on your bike and you went to yeah. Japan to do that because you couldn't yeah. get into South Korea. I think that was right because your bike was yeah. registered in Mongolia. All these things you exactly. would never, you'd, you couldn't plan for. I mean, it just happens and yeah. you deal with it. So you went there, I went around Korea, then I went to Japan. Um, I decided that I wanted to travel alone and that's a, that's a key point to talk about because for me that was quite a hard time at the trip you know I, I planned to go travel around the world alone then we got mm. put in touch and we traveled together for quite a ways across Russia which to be honest I wouldn't have had it any other way it was it was good you know mm. we helped each other yeah. um, we made it across together we had a good laugh while we was doing it um, uh, but I think by the time I got to Magadan I was like I was missing that solo trip that I wanted to do from the beginning um, so it was kind of like a point where, well, you need to just go fix your engine. I wanted to go travel alone. And at that point we separated and we went our own ways. Now, from there I went to Korea, Japan, um, and down through Malaysia, um, in, down, through that, down through Southeast Asia into Malaysia and Australia, New Zealand. And where did you go then? You went from Japan. I a I think way. from from Japan onwards, I, I basically followed your trails. I actually, we did a bit opposite loops through yeah. Cambodia, Laos, and Thailand. Um, but we we basically missed each other by a day or two. But we we took very very similar routes, but yeah. um, the other way around. Um, then I did go also down through Malaysia, Singapore, uh -huh. and then back into um, mm. Indonesia, and then over to East Timor. Mm. But when you went from East Timor, you drove, to, you went down to Australia to to race in the Finke Desert race. I remember. Yeah, that's right. And at that time, I went to I went to the US. Um, I shipped my bike over to California yeah. because I had some friends going to a festival in the desert called Burning Man. Burning Man. Which uh, something yeah, some, something which I, I never knew anything about until you went. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd been wanting to go for a while, so so basically I shipped the bike over and then and then actually rolled the bike when it arrived. I took a little break in the summer to 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 visit my parents, and we we took a we actually took a side trip to Africa for a month with my parents and my dad. Nice. We went up to Kilimanjaro, mm -hmm. went to visit the gorillas in Rwanda, and then mm -hmm. I flew over to to California to go to Burning Man with a bunch of friends of mine, uh, cool. and had a fantastic time. And then told you a lot about it. Yeah. And I remember that you then started getting interested as well. And we met, we actually met up at the time in San Francisco because you were giving a workshop at Piston and Chain. That's right, yeah. Um, and but, yeah, and then I started and then I started going around the US from, from there onwards. Okay. So you went to the US, I went down to Australia. We actually met, yeah, I was in the States. I actually went to do Baja Rally and that's when I did the mm -hmm. talk. So I was mm -hmm. at Piston and Chain, did the Baja Rally, then went up back to Australia. Um, and then from there, you you must have spent quite a bit of time in the States, correct? Um, yeah, I think I spent about half a year or so even. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Um, and then I eventually made it to the States and went up to Alaska and then rode all the mm -hmm. way down through um, Central America. And was you in front of us? You'd, oh, was you... Behind as a cat. I were a little bit, yeah. I were ahead of you. I was okay. ahead of, of you and Tony when when I went through Central America. Yeah. But basically, I think you did you did a lot more kilometers in the same time as me. Probably a third to a, to to half more. Yes, yeah, so I was. Um, I, I was trying to get to the start of Dakar. So I left. Yeah. I left. I left the USA in October, and Dakar was in mm -hmm. January in South America. Mm -hmm. So I had like three months to get down to. Uh, this, to Paraguay for the start of the Dakar and I teamed up with my yeah. old friend, British guy, Tony Antwer, that I used to live near in Texas and he yep. quit his job, got himself a 701 and uh, we travelled together from Mexico all the way down through Central America and we actually met ourselves mm -hmm. in, we met together again in Costa Rica. Um, yes. And in Costa Rica... For some uh, proper <laughs> off-roading. 
in Costa Rica. And planned, what, what, but... what better to do as a reunion with Lucas after all these years traveling around the world and doing different things and riding together and meeting each other was to go off-roading. So we let Lucas lead the way with some Google, <laughs> Google, Google map tracks. Yes. <laughs> And, uh, Open street maps it was, and yeah, those we, maps were. I need know. to find the episode number, and I'll I'll find the episode number, and I'll get it in this uh, video. I'll put, try and put a link into it at the top of the screen now, so you can see. Um, but it was um, it was extreme. It was I think it was yes. the the single most extreme day on races to places. It was brutal. We did yeah. twelve kilometers in about sixteen hours, or something like that. Yep. <laughs> it was yeah. horrendous. We literally had to drag our bikes up these slopes because we went downhill. And the thing yeah. is, when you go down, if there's no way out, you've got to go back up again. And we was pulling yes. bikes with ropes. And thankfully, there's three of us. But I can honestly say I was exhausted after that day. It was it was a rough day. Yeah. It was. Yeah. <laughs> but then again, if you if you didn't like that, that that was one point that I wanted to bring up. When I have to say for the for the part through. Asia, looking back, I mean, there were situations when we had water crossings in Mongolia, when I got my bike stuck in this <clears throat> in this swamp more than once or through a river crossing. If I had been alone, it would have been either I could not have taken those routes or I yeah. would I would have been in trouble for real. Well, you yeah. also think differently when you're alone because you get to those water crossings and you think, True. yeah, it's just not worth it because... Yeah. If, I, if I become stranded here or injure myself, I'm screwed. Whereas when you're with somebody yeah. else, the advantage of that is we would look at each other and say, nah, we're not turning back, let's do it. You know, yeah. And you try yeah. it because there's somebody there to help. And if it all goes tits up, uh, belly up, you can do something different and someone can go find help. We'll figure out a way. Do, do you remember crossing that river in, was it Costa Rica or was it in Nicaragua? Nicaragua. Where we crossed that river on those little narrow boats with the bikes yeah, with Tony. Yeah, 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 oh, of course. I'm going to put wow. a pic picture in of that as well. <laughs> that is the sketchiest river crossing yeah. on a boat I have ever done in my life. I mean, how one yeah. of our bikes didn't end up in the bottom of that river, I have no idea. But kudos it's to the true. guys that took us across there in the boat. But I remember my knuckles, I was grabbing onto the side of the boat like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, basically, the boats were about <clears throat> half as long as they should have been to fit the bike in. So we had to put the front of the bike up on a plank with the with the front part of the bike sticking out. And I have, I remember we had to put weight on the back of the bike so that they wouldn't fall over. Exactly. Uh, and the whole thing was maybe 20 the centimeters bike... wider than the bike. So it was very, very wobbly. Honestly, I think it was not a good feeling to see our bikes that way. I think with the luggage, the bikes were wider than the boat. Like, literally, it yeah, was like, for sure. it was not yeah. good. And obviously, the bike was stood up. So it was top heavy. So the boat was yeah. just like this. I mean, it was crazy. Um, <laughs> Sketchy as hell. Yeah, but some some really good times and some good insights into traveling alone and traveling together. I mean, there's pros and cons of everything, um, as always. And I always say, traveling alone, you really do have more opportunities to spend time with the locals, and you're a lot more welcomed as an individual. Uh, when people see you on alone, they, alone, they really want to help you. Um, so I had some really great experiences. I'm sure you did the same, Lucas, traveling alone, where you meet people and you stay sure. at people's houses and everything, which you, you get a little bit less when you're in a group or you're with two people because when we were together, we would tend to just talk to each other and go and camp where we wanted to camp and we wouldn't talk to the locals. So that's always a, an interesting point that I re to people. So Costa Rica, I'm heading down to the Dakar Um yeah, for the Dakar 2017, um, we go down through Central America, we get the style rat together, we end up in Colombia, um, that's a, a whole new episode, the style rat episode, um, and for anybody watching, I understand that the style rat, the steel rat, the boat that goes, that went from Panama to Colombia is no more, I understand it's been sold, um, uh, so that's, that's now not available anymore which is a real shame because i know so many travelers uh, used that with captain ludwig and if anybody else went on there put a comment in below in this video um, and uh, let us know about your experience but we had a good time on the style of that fantastic trip yeah for sure yeah so we got to colombia um and we was in a bit of a rush i mean me and tony i had to get to dakar so we had to get off and get riding yeah. so 
we we got off, we got riding. You did a little bit of work on your bike, um, and yeah. then continued down. Um, but then your trip came to a stop in Ecuador, correct? Yes, in so, Ecuador. And I think this is the point where I let you explain what happened because a lot of people that are listening to this podcast probably have no idea what happened to Lucas in Ecuador. Um, and thank you for volunteering to come on and tell everybody about it because I know you've not really talked that much about it publicly. Um, so I appreciate that and I'm going to let you explain what happened. Um, yes, so basically about a little bit short of three years into the trip, um, it was in February of 2017, um, I had I just had a friend come down to Ecuador, Malcolm, a friend of mine from New York, he came down to Ecuador, we had a 10 day trip around the country that was absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I also met uh, the KTM importers in KTM Ecuador on the weekend and they basically took me around with a group of their best friends and clients had another fantastic trip. So I had a really, really good time in Ecuador with a bunch of friendly people and it's a gorgeous country. Um, but I was getting ready to move on. And I, so I took my, I took my bike uh, down and I wanted to cross into Peru. Um, on the way, I had some technical problems. Basically, my radiator fan went out. I tried to fix it, didn't really work, but it started getting dark a bit on that day. But I still knew that I was in the middle of, of nowhere and I wanted to get to the border so that the next morning um, I could cross. Because if you show up at a border early, you have a bigger chance of crossing without huge delays, without huge waiting times. Yeah. Um, so as it was, it was uh, getting dark, um, I was still uh, making my way to the border. I and mean, then at some point I was getting a bit cooler and I was wondering how long it was. So I looked down at my GPS as I was riding. Um, saw that it was still 20 kilometers or whatever to go. But as I look up, um, right ahead of me, there had been like it was a bit foggy. Um, so all of a sudden, I saw out of the fog, I was not going that fast, maybe 50 kilometers an hour or so. But out of the fog, I saw pop up some big rocks that were in the middle of the road. Um, this is a, it, mount, it's it a mountain road. That, it's a mountain road. Yes, yeah. Sorry, yeah. It's a mountain road it's, and it's a mountain a road. A lot of landslides on that road. And yeah. I went I went on the same road. There's a lot of places where even the tarmac's fallen away. Like and there's like holes okay. in the road and stuff. So just to give people yeah. a bit of an idea of the road that we're talking about, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's a it's a mountain road, it's on the side of a of a of a steep mountain, it's cloud forest, so it's always a bit foggy. You don't see that great. Um, it's gravel, and, and the road where I was riding it was not even it was not even an asphalt road. It was just gravel. Um, but basically, I saw these big rocks pop up that had been from from a mud uh, landslide going down, um, and I was not going fast enough to crash into them. But rather, I was able to to. But I was going too fast to break. So what I did is I swerved out of the way, yeah. um, and it ended up on the side of the road. There was a like a little ditch, a, a valley. There was maybe maybe a bit more than almost a half a meter, a meter deep. Mm -hmm. um, and the problem was it was also very gravelly. Um, but because I was still moving and it was it was very slippery, um, I couldn't really break that fast. And as I was going in this ditch and I couldn't steer out of it, but I saw that there was a big metal pole um, sticking out of the ground coming up. It was either from a road sign or it was from a from a fence post. I'm not sure. But it was um, a steel post that was cemented into the ground. And I knew if I hit this thing head on, then it's pretty surely game over. Mm -hmm. um, so what I did is as I was going towards this, um, as I was going towards this pole, I basically said, OK, I can't get out of the ditch. I can't break in time. So what I did is I, I literally jumped off the bike um, tried to push myself off, tried to jump off. But as I was midair, the whole pole crashed into my leg and hit me hit me on my leg and basically it almost ended up tearing my leg off um and and i tumbled tumbled into some tumbled into some rocks um and then i was just lying there um and you were alone yeah you weren't and, tumbling with anybody so you're on no your own. i was i was on my own at that time and it'd been about maybe maybe an hour and a half or so two hours since since i'd last seen any people in a little village it's a quiet um road. so i was lying in the ditch on the side of the road and basically took me took me a few minutes to catch my breath i didn't i didn't pass out the whole time i didn't lose consciousness um so basically i tried to get my bearings and then i took sort of a little damage assessment what had happened and the problem was i saw my leg that was supposed to be straight pointed basically sideways 
Mm -hmm. um, so I knew that, that just below the knee, it, it basically it pointed to the side. So I knew that this was really not in not in good shape. Mm -hmm. um, and but I couldn't see much else because I was wearing a fully protective suit. So I was wearing motocross boots. Mm -hmm. So the legs had just above the boots. It basically had snapped sideways. Yeah. Um, um, <coughs> and, and then we're talking about like proper everything broken, like in there. Everything broken. Yeah. Yes. So basically, this is how I found out about it. I was like, okay, so my leg is broken. I should probably try to to from this position make it straight again, so that it doesn't really flop mm. around so much because it can't be good to have it sideways. Um, so what I then did is um, I tried because on my bike, just like you, I travel when I travel alone. I have a um, uh, it's called the Delorme Inridge. It's basically yeah. a device that you can use to send off a signal via the uh, satellite system. You can send out a SOS signal or even messages to to pre-program messages to certain numbers. Yeah. But the problem was I had this device on my bike and the bike was maybe three, four, five meters away. So I thought, okay, no problem, I'll get over there. First, I tried to grab my phone, which was on my chest pocket. Um, I tried to grab that, but it was literally bent to banana shape um, because it was formed around my chest from, from all the impacts from the tumbling around. So the phone didn't work. So basically, I thought, okay, I need to get over to my bike to 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 grab that in reach and then send off an SOS signal because this was a completely deserted mountain road. It was night, so I wasn't even sure if anybody was ever going to come there. I hadn't seen anybody far for an hour and a half. Um, but as I'm so, I, I, I try with the with the good leg. I try to kind of push myself backwards, and I'm and I'm noticing, okay, I really cannot push because the yeah. the leg immediately gave way. Um, and I felt like some swelling on the side. And as it, as it turned out on the leg, that was not completely broken. I had torn the side ligament and I had torn, I had broken a part of the uh, tibia, uh, sorry, of the fibula as well on the, so on the right leg. The, mm. the left leg was the one completely smashed to pieces. Um, so then I thought, what else I can do? Just for so everybody what I did watching is I though, to... that's a really, it's a really important point to anybody that travels that carries an inReach or a satellite communicator or a satellite phone, please carry it on yourself, not on the bike. Yeah. Like it's really important. Yeah. I see people mounting it on the handlebars and things. And if you're on your own, it's really important to have it on your on yourself. So sorry, carry on. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a tough point. I'm still not 100% sure what the right way would be because if the phone that I had on me broke into pieces, Damaged. so I thought it would be good to have, to have one device on you and one on the bike. But in this situation, turns out that neither one helped me because as I was trying to then basically push myself off with my arms to push myself towards the bike, I noticed that the bone basically popped out of my shoulder because I'd also broken the, mm. I'd broken the collarbone. And I'd, for me, I felt, even though I knew that this was a life and death situation, like in a movie, you see people mm. getting shot in the leg, you see them with a broken leg and they still move around. Yeah. Like when you have a broken, like when you have a broken uh, body part, you really cannot put any weight on it. You cannot push right. yourself off with it. It just doesn't work because the basically your your, your nervous system just shuts everything down because mm -hmm. the body wants to protect you from from hurting itself even more. Mm -hmm. So walking on a broken leg, it doesn't work. You might be able to hop on the other one, but since both my legs were broken and my shoulder was the the, the collarbone was broken and and some some um, mm. ligaments were torn. I literally couldn't move myself. I had one one good uh, one good part, the left arm. So this I could use to move things and touch things, but I really couldn't move. I wanted to, yeah. but I couldn't. Mm -hmm. And I was lying there. And then basically, I had to hope. I was just lying there and thinking, okay, I hope to God that something is gonna somebody comes. something is gonna somebody's gonna show up and actually use this road in the evenings. And then another point is in South America and Central America in general at night you really don't want to stop like these accidents mm. it can be like these things happen that that people set them up as a trap so you're always very cautious that you yeah. that you stop and and i wasn't sure if somebody was going to stop and besides that I, I, there was a it was the side of the mountain and i was lying down here so if somebody drove on a road here um there was not even it wasn't a sure thing that they would find me luckily mm. my climb suit that i was wearing it was a proper motorcycle reflective suit mm. so when you shine a bit of light on it it lights up and and Mm -hmm. uh, and you you were well seen um and then basically i was waiting and and um i was like waiting and lying and and the pain was getting worse and worse after about 20 25 minutes the, adrenaline the realization wears sets off. In. yeah <laughs> yes yeah. the adrenaline wears off and then you feel it more and more and more so mm -hmm. every time i shifted around my body somewhere a little bit because basically all the 
body parts were broken whenever you shift a little bit it, mm. it it's bad it, it's really not a mm. not a good place to be in um so after about um after about i think it was maybe 45 minutes or so um actually a truck showed up and somehow he saw me or i'm not 100 percent sure because i don't recall the conversation in detail but mm. but he he stopped and he saw me came over and and saw that i was not in good shape because my leg was still pointing to the side so mm. it was pretty obvious and i told him please get help and and he um i was lucky enough he you're quite lucky as well that you speak spanish yeah you speak spanish yes. so communicating was much easier if that you know i didn't speak spanish yeah. at that time when i traveled through south america so i wouldn't yeah. be very good with that yeah if that had happened in russia and i wasn't able to communicate to people i mean he saw that i was in not in good shape mm. so he probably would have called help but in the in the what how, how things turned out later on it was very good to be to be fluent in spanish and be able mm. to sort everything out and mm. and um and get things taken care of mm. so luckily he had on his on his old school nokia phone he still had one bar of reception um and he called an ambulance um and then we basically waited because the problem was that the next village was an hour and a half two hours away yep. um and the ambulance that later it was about two hours until they showed up uh, when they came it was it turned out to be like an old pickup truck time type of thing um and uh, because the ambulance was basically the volunteer firefighters from the from mm -hmm. the next village over um and they picked me up in this car with really really short suspension um <laughs> and also because they were not they were not i don't know what it was what the legal designation is but basically they're not doctors so they're not mm -hmm. allowed to to carry any injectable painkillers pain or anything really strong yeah so they just gave me some some pills and when you're there, it turned out that I had seven seven fractures in, in various bones in the body. Um, so they gave me these pill painkillers and that didn't really work work enough. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but they loaded they loaded me up. It took that was also a long process because they couldn't grab me anywhere. So they, they had this it was type of a it looked like a wooden door to, mm. to load me up. It was not a proper stretcher. Mm. And loaded me in the ambulance, and then we took the long trip to the hospital. In the end, I think it was six or seven hours from yeah. the time I had the accident until I was actually in the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, and then and they started. Bike, they you also just left did, your bike behind and all your gear and everything. Just... <laughs> I, I did leave the bike behind, but I was really lucky. I, I told you before that I had these. Uh, I had met these guys from from KTM, the importers of KTM in Ecuador. It, it's a family called the Malos. There is a, mm. there is a Wilson Senior and a Wilson Junior. Yep. And they were they were absolutely fantastic people. Cool. I had actually spent some time at KTM in Quito in the capital of Ecuador mm. to fix uh, fix my bike as we do in most cities. When you have to mm -hmm. do a service, you do it at the, ideally at the KTM dealership. Yeah. Um, so luckily I was able to reach them and they, they really helped me out. They told the driver, um, the driver where, which hospital to go to they set up a doctor that had operated one of the guys there before. Okay. Um, they sent one of the guys that I had that that I had met on the trip before. He came to the hospital and he actually brought me a phone so I could call my parents. Um, and basically, he asked me, "Hey, whatever you need, I'll I'll help you." Um, so they were really the 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 people in Ecuador were absolutely fantastic helping me out. And that's really that's a really good point about traveling anywhere because. You meet the, the the adventure motorcycle community. You meet people everywhere you travel, all over the world. Yeah. And you know, for me, yeah. they helped no end with fixing my bike, rebuilding my engine. Yeah. You know, places to stay, getting parts, helping importing things, and getting it through the bureaucracy yeah. in different countries. But in your case as well, yeah. in a in a serious medical situation where you needed help, it's nice to have those connections and contacts to be able to do that. Exactly. Yeah. No, it's really good when you're in a country alone even though i speak spanish you don't know anybody you don't have yeah. family you don't have friends that can come up uh, come over to you and and help you so it was fantastic to have these 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 have met these group of people and they were so generous and they yeah. they basically showed up in the middle of the night i arrived at the hospital i think at 2 a.m showed up in the middle of the night brought me a phone so i could call my Friendly parents yeah. kept them up to date while i was under under and the anesthesia so i couldn't talk and and really tried to arrange everything mm -hmm. they were super super helpful and they at the same time that i was my bike because i knew if i leave this bike now i'm never ever going to see it again yep. so luckily the guys from ktm they sent that that same night they sent the truck uh, to come pick up the bike and it and it arrived i think almost at the same time as my ambulance arrived <laughs> yeah. um, and they had uh, good old patricia picked up 
and brought back to the KTM dealership in Cuenca, which is the city closest to the border where I had left from that day. Okay. Um, so yeah, so they go on, carry on. Um, I, I was going to say they carried the next day. They came to the hospital, um, especially Wilson Malo and and another another friend of his came and and really helped me out with with getting getting everything set up, mm -hmm. um, visiting me in the hospital to make sure that I'm well taken care of. Okay, so then from there you have had an extremely long and painful recovery. <laughs> Yes. Um, a combination yeah. of operations, um, maybe done not as adequately as they should have been, having to have things done again. Uh, just tell us a little bit about that process. So basically, um, when I was operated on in Ecuador, I don't know if it was the situation because my leg was in such such bad shape, but they operated the left leg, the one that was broken in three or four places, mm -hmm. um, and they it was not it was not perfectly arranged what it was because of how messed up the leg was but basically what they ended up doing is the leg was like this and they stitched it back on like this so it was at an angle and also what what happened was that my foot that should have been pointing straight forward it's ended twisted. up being out rotated outwards about seven degrees because the way um my whole leg the way the foot attaches the whole since the whole shin was broken my foot was only it was only you mm -hmm. could move it around everywhere because it was broken mm -hmm. in so many places so it was just attached through through skin and muscle and, mm -hmm. and nerve endings, but there was no bones holding it together. Mm -hmm. So what they end up doing is they drill a, a hole in the top of your shin and they insert a long metal rod that goes all the way from, from the top of your knee to the to the to your yeah. foot. And then they mm -hmm. put a screw in the top uh, in the bottom and a screw in the top. And this is what rotates the what keeps yeah. the foot in position. So we actually um, have some the, we actually have some pictures of the X ray before, yeah? And also yeah. the X ray yeah. after the repair to show you yeah. the damage that happened in, in your leg. And I'll, I'll put those yeah. up now, but you also have something to show us there. Yeah? I have a little, a little prop to show what exactly they put inside my leg. So this, this is like a, a metal rod. And you can see here, here are the long bolts. So they're about three, four centimeters long. And this whole thing gets placed inside your bone marrow. So it's about yeah. maybe 30, 40, 35 centimeters long. Yeah. So this was inserted inside my shin. And then they drill holes on top and bottom to keep the foot from rotating. But yeah. they didn't really have the foot aligned uh, when they drilled the hole. Mm -hmm. So my foot ended up, it took a long time to heal back together because there were so many fractures. The shin was broken in two places. And when it did finally heal together, probably this took three or four operations, almost two years. And I was on crutches for in total, probably a year or so out of, yeah. from yeah. the various operations, but it ended up being uh, bent a bit sideways and the foot was rotated outwards. So it was a yeah. bit of a mess. So I had to get more surgeries to get that fixed. And then it didn't heal again. And it was, uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's call it a bit of a painful long process. So I think okay. it's in total, it was yeah. seven, eight operations yeah. to and finally get back to where I am now. Yeah. yeah. Three so, years. Yeah. Yeah. What well, three years in total? Wow, it's a long time yeah. ago. So it is a long time. It it's taken a long time to explain, but that's what happened to Lucas M. <laughs> and uh, yes. Uh, and you know, at that at that same time, um, you kind of obviously your main focus and priority was getting yourself better. You know, and yeah. while we were traveling, we both had a social media presence and. Everybody mm -hmm. saw you disappear. Now that was obviously a conscious decision from yourself to kind of this is not important. You know what's important is to get yeah. myself right. Is that how it was? Is that you just thought I just need to focus on getting myself right? Pretty much. Um, I mean, I've always had a bit of a love hate relationship with mm -hmm. with social media and and time spent on the computer. I mean, I do see mm -hmm. it has it absolutely has some positives like meeting you meeting mm -hmm. Walter, meeting meeting a bunch of people on the trip. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the great connections I've made were through connections that I've made online because I didn't know many of these people before from in, in real world because when I come to Japan or when I came to the US, I, in, in Japan, I stayed with somebody um, and I was able to repair my bike in a week. And these were all connections that I've that I've made online or the same in San Diego with, yeah. with, your, with our joint yeah. friend, Kirk. Yeah. Yeah. These were just people that I've met online. But I, what I have noticed with myself is that this whole time that you, that you, whenever you're online, you're not really present with the people that you're with, or you're mm -hmm. not really 
focusing on work you need to do mm-hmm. so there is a bit of a, a trade off with with having having being spending time online and being present on social media versus just being very present in your in your local environment with the people that are, that are around you or are focusing on the task at hand yeah so in the beginning for me it was a thing that i like you said i wanted to focus on just get better and i thought that it would take a couple of months because i'd spoken to other people that had um mm. a broken broken tibia and, and fib- fibula um so i thought it would be a process maybe a couple of months and then i'll get yeah. back on the trip jump back on the on the bike and and finish the trip and then maybe start posting again but with all these delays in the operations um i wasn't i wasn't able to travel i didn't really want to show pictures from the from the trip before so basically i said look this is not adding a lot of value to my life at the moment and i mm-hmm. and i wanted to focus on being being back with my family being mm-hmm. with friends um enjoying being being back home yeah um so basically it's, i didn't really post anymore since then yeah it's really interesting cuz like it's for me it's like catch 22 you know i want to i i always I'm always trying to reduce my time on social media, but social media mm. is is my life and my business as well, you know? And it's 100%. really difficult trying to find a balance of like now I have to schedule time. Like that's my social yeah. media time. And then when I go to the workshop, I almost have to put my phone on like don't disturb because I want to get sure. work done. And it's really difficult managing how much time you spend on social media versus not. And you know, I'm sure for you like your personal life and the things that you do and the things you enjoy hasn't changed that much just since stopping going on so- social media you just have other opportunities and more time to spend doing other things um so exactly. it's always, yeah it's always a a fine balance but i often get told by camilla that i've got it wrong <laughs> so yes um so right i mean with your situation i do feel it's different because like you said you're you're making a living from it you've mm-hmm. you've had all these opportunities of from people that you've met online that that you've met on your trip from your from your various projects your customers yeah. i mean it does make sense to share and and you do yeah. you you are doing a lot of interesting things that was also yeah. for for uh, for me on the trip it was a fantastic way to yeah. just be able to share what your experiences with other people um share share also what you've learned where you are inspire other people to do these kind of things and show them that that anybody can do around the world trip i mean yeah. this is not a this is not something that's that's only mm-hmm. to f- lucky if you if you really set mm-hmm. your mind to it you can really do it and i think social yeah. media is a great way to to show yeah. that and inspire people to do it it definitely opened a lot of doors for me i think the only thing mm-hmm. i would say is you just you've got to find that balance that works for you you know you can spend yeah. as long as you want on social media but you can do enough with a small amount of time yeah. to get those benefits without wasting all your time on it and uh, that's True. for me the difficult thing finding the balance so we just talked about that and obviously we've just spent quite a bit of time um talking out about a little bit of a negative side of travel and that's mm-hmm. the possibility of getting injured i mean i've had i've had all kinds of yeah. things happen to me around the world uh, which one day when i finish my book i keep saying this on every podcast but one day when i finish mm-hmm. it people get to see all the crazy things that happened to me that you wouldn't expect but yeah. we must also say that like i don't want that to put people off going traveling like it's one of those things it that can happen it can happen to anybody you know i broke my ankle racing sonora valley um okay i was mm. racing but at any one moment you don't even have to be racing you could be riding to the shops mm. and something drifts onto your side of the road and you have an accident True. like you you, yeah. you mustn't be put off by this stuff and i'm sure the whole experience i mean for you now you must look back on it yes it was a complete pain in the ass but i bet it's changed you as a person that whole experience in, in for, for the, for the no, better I... for for you know you you do you become stronger after these experiences so how has how do you think it's affected you no you do need you do need this adversity to to grow as a person if things always go according to plan and easy then you're never going to grow and you're never going to become more resilient Yeah. So in this in this way it really helped me and I think I've done a pretty good job of not focusing so much on on the bad thing that happened but rather seeing it as a positive because there was a very serious chance like in the beginning when I arrived at the hospital mm-hmm. the whole thing was swollen very badly there was a lot of blood basically the blood was not able to circulate so there was some dead tissue and they were not sure if they were able to save the leg so they told me look we have to put you under anesthesia look at it and then we can only once we cut it open we can see whether we can even save this so i've basically every single day i've told myself how lucky i am to still have that you. i was found 
Yes, that I then that I had the leg, and now I mean I'm lucky that it also it basically I'm I'm back to ninety ninety five percent now. I even went skiing for the first time this winter. Nice. Um, so that that worked out well, and but there was never any moment when I said, "Look, I wish I hadn't done this trip." Not yeah, no. not one single, no. not one single moment. Yeah. Um, but it is. I I do think that one thing that I've learned from it is, um, I I think we were both that that is also something I've really appreciated about you is like even these these painful things like it's cold it's wet the bike yeah. breaks down you need to fix it we just always had a laugh on our faces and we we kind of we kind of decided look we're we we are in the, we're here because we want to mm. um we didn't we didn't take the, we, we're not taking the easy way because yeah. we want to we're taking the hard roads we're picking out these challenges and yeah. if you it's a lot of it is a matter of perspective if you're willing to put up with it and if you're willing to look at it from a certain way that that it's a challenge that you can get over exactly. overcome yeah um then then the whole thing becomes a lot less painful and it was the same time for me with my injury yeah um okay. at this at the same time one thing that it, it has made me think about is that even though i took some precautions like the having this this in reach satellite mm. device that you can send an sos signal um, I do remember that there were a lot of times on my trip where I was on, for example, the, one of the good the, the things that people are familiar with is the Baja 1000, the race uh -huh. through through Baja, Mexico. Uh -huh. um, I did because I wanted to have the challenge uh, on my travel bike. I did the Baja one, some old Baja 1000 tracks of some tracks I got off the internet, and a lot of them you could see that they were ridden maybe a few times a year. Yeah. So I keep telling myself, like, and I remember that there were some spots where I didn't see anybody for a day and a half, two days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I know if, if some a crash like this had happened there, like no chance, it would have been game over. Yeah. So as a solo traveler, <coughs> I think you need to be more careful about picking your routes. And, yeah. and I do think um, it gives you a lot more like a safety net to ride with a second person. So if you mm -hmm. can team up with somebody and it was an ideal match with you in the beginning because mm -hmm. I learned a lot from you and it, and it worked out fantastic. We had the same yeah. preferences. Um, I think it's fantastic if you can team up with with other people because it gives you more freedom to do more challenging things, and at yeah. the same time, even you can you still have a backup in yeah. case you are so incapacitated mm -hmm. that you cannot call help yourself. It mm -hmm. it might save your life. Yeah, yeah, I've um, done some. It's not something that. Sh can't. I would say it's it's not it's definitely not something that should stop you from from doing a trip, yeah. because finding somebody to ride around the world with might be impossible. But uh, it's something that I would try to and maybe do sections with people yeah. and, and try to or team up with other riders for parts of it um, yeah. if you can. And otherwise, pick your routes in a way and, and have maybe redundant big backup safety systems, like have one DeLorme on you and one mm -hmm. on the bike. Even yeah. though it's an extra expense, it might save yeah. your life. Yeah. And I, and I think for me, I, I probably traveled about 60% of my trip solo um, and the mm -hmm. other 40% with different people. And actually... It worked mm. really well. I got to ride alone. I rode on some roads sometimes, yeah. took some easy routes. Then I rode with us and I did some really challenging routes. I also did yeah. some really stupid challenging routes alone. Um, and I got lucky, you know, and I took the risk yeah. and it's what I wanted to do. But it's the most important thing is to make your trip your own and do it the way you want to do it. If you feel more comfortable doing it with somebody else, do it with somebody else. But to be honest, I felt more comfortable doing it with somebody else when I was with you. The first time I went alone mm -hmm. after all that time, it was like, oof, you know? But you just, yeah. once you start doing it alone, you get comfortable with it. Um, and the more you do alone, the more comfortable you get. Uh, so I think it's uh, just everybody take away what they can from this discussion and make up their own mind when they come to doing trips. Uh, yeah. Um, so, you mentioned the word Patricia. Um, Pat <laughs> Patricia is your second bike, so your 690 Rally. Um, yes. How, how did it get the name Patricia? I can't remember. <laughs> oh, my dear Lyndon, my good friend. <laughs> so apparently I was not quick enough to give my bike a name because I'm not really good at naming things and I've never named uh, an inanimate <laughs> object before. So somehow very quickly into the trip, like a week or two into riding, you said, look, as if you don't come up with the name quick, it's going to be, uh, your bike is going to be called Patricia from now on. And somehow, even though I did like it in the beginning, it's stuck. And then I think it's officially it's, Patricia now. It's been, it's, she's been named that for five years now. Yeah, I think it's kind of cool. I think it's kind of cool. Basil yeah. definitely misses Patricia. And where is Patricia now? 
so Patricia is is now still in Ecuador. Um, like okay. I told you before, in the beginning, I was I was planning to be back back on the bike in a couple of months after mm -hmm. healing up, but yeah. this whole whole thing turned out into much longer. I didn't want to ship the bike back to Europe and then have to ship it to the US again because we're probably speaking about four or five thousand euros. And since I had planned to finish the trip. Mm -hmm. um, or at least finish South America. Um, I wanted to keep the bike there. And luckily the guys from, from KTM Ecuador, so the Malo family, and then now another friend of mine called Cristobal that also runs a motorcycle yeah. shop. They, they've agreed to pick, they picked up the bike and then now they're storing it there for me in Ecuador. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. it's still in the same state after the crash, but I've, I have received a bunch of pictures and it's, and it's very repairable. If you, okay. if I compare it to seven broken bones. Yeah. It's probably a process of a week or two of yeah. ordering some some new parts, bolting yeah. them on, and fixing yeah. it up versus having bones that take months or years to grow back to where they were before. I know a good place so you she's can get still rally in parts Ecuador. if you need any. <laughs> yeah, not so easy. But I, my plan was always to pack everything up because I had the pictures, and and yeah. the guys in Ecuador said that they would take her apart and tell me exactly what is broken, and I would pack them up in my luggage, fly back fix the bike at, at the KTM workshop in Ecuador and then finish South America. That was a plan. But then three years of recovery of, of having, having basically not being able to walk properly, being on crutches and not being able to ride a bike. And then COVID happened. Um, so traveling has not really been on the cards. Uh, and then about uh, eight months ago, I met a girl <laughs> as it happens. So right. this whole travel thing, for the time being um is not really a priority i don't really have a strong desire to get back on the road and it, that that, gonna i be think my as, next as long as yeah. yeah i think at the moment i'm not really i mean i could i could ride again now and i've and i've actually gone back on bikes that, uh, with my cousin alex that we've meant to talked about before we've been back on mm -hmm. driving driving some some nice mountain roads here riding on some nice mountain roads here in austria i have okay. uh, taken some easy off-road routes but nothing nothing hardcore yet and i want to slowly get back into it yeah. um but i think as long as as COVID is happening i don't think it's a fantastic time to travel and and being in love here in austria and having also <laughs> i went back into the family business yeah. um so i have some commitments here and i'm not really i don't really feel a strong urge to to jump back on the bike um, mm. at the moment. Let's, yeah. let's put it this way. Okay, good. There's a question coming from one of my patrons about how to balance yes. trips versus home life. So we'll come on, we'll come on to that yep. later. But uh, so what have you been doing with yourself uh, work-wise? And I know you've got a big man cave as well, because I've been there. Um, you've got a workshop with lots of toys and tools and parts and bikes and half built yes. stuff and everything. Uh, yes. Tell some people what you've been doing uh, at home, you know, during COVID and, and also what you're doing for work, just to tell people. Yeah. So when I came came back from the trip um, after after I knew that, well, after I knew that it would take a while, um, before the trip, I worked in the family business. So my family has been in renewable energy. It's a business that my dad started about 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So this is what I did before the trip. So we're building building renewable energy power plants basically around the world now. So we're in, in Europe and in, in Africa and South America. Yeah. Um, started off with wind, uh, with, with hydropower about 30 years ago, then switched to, to wind power and then photovoltaic solar energy over the last couple of years as the technology has changed a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a it's a it's a great business to be in, but it's become fairly competitive or very much more competitive the last couple of years. So it was yeah. hard to how to make money in it because you're competing a lot of big players. Yeah. Um, so when I came back, we we decided together with with my family that it would make sense to start diversifying a bit into other businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and this was great for me because we didn't really have experience in other fields. And I I have a business background. I, I have a master's degree in in business with a focus on finance. So it made sense for, for somebody to get educated in other things. Um, so what I've been doing the last couple of years is to to add some more investments to our family, to the renewable energy business. In addition, we've been doing some venture capital. So basically funding funding startups, early stage startups, mm -hmm. doing some private equity <clears throat> where you acquire stakes in businesses completely unrelated to renewable energy. So yeah. one thing, for example, we've, we've been doing is real estate in all places in South America. So we have a self where we're, we're shareholder in a self storage business in, in Peru, actually. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's a shame so it's not in Ecuador. Different... You could have put Patricia there. Yeah. 
if we were thinking about going into Ecuador, which would be a good reason to come visit, and mm -hmm. then since we do have some good contacts there, we're still looking into it. So that yeah. might might happen as well. Okay, good. So this is this is the business side, mm -hmm. and then in the man cave, I do have a garage, a good workshop that I've been equipping more and more professionally because as I've been spending more time in it, I realized that this is a hobby hobby of mine that I'm always going to have. So I'm yeah. I'm building, I'm building, I'm restoring two old cars. I have a a Shelby Cobra replica, and I have an yeah. old Porsche 911 from 1977 nice. that I'm restoring. And you do need to have quite a bit of tools. And also having been inspired going to your shops and having <laughs> been to many workshops around the world, I've been I've been gearing up a bit. And I now have a TIG welder and I have a, I have a MIG welder and I have a small lathe and I have all kinds of tools that are enabling me to basically do all my own work. And what I've what I did with Daki in the in the hills in Mongolia to build up Patricia, mm. I'm now able to do most of these things at, at, at in my own workshop because it's something that I've really enjoyed, especially now in Corona times. I'm, I'm spending a lot of time in the workshop when you're not allowed to go out. Um, it's a fantastic hobby to have because you can mm. you can go deep down the rabbit hole of, of fabricating things and building things with your own hand. So yeah. that's something that I've really, really enjoyed yeah. because my day job is very finance based and very a lot of Excel yeah. models, a lot of PowerPoint presentations. So it's something that I really enjoyed is to do build something with my hands um, and then have a finished physical product in front of you, like a, like a similar to a craftsman that builds something either from the ground up or you improve something. Yeah. Yeah. It's something that I know I'm going to keep as a hobby for a long, long time. Yeah. And it's, I know that you've invested quite a bit in your workshop, uh, you know, after seeing mine yeah. and, and taking some yeah. ideas from that. And one thing that I realize now is at the start, when you start working on your own bikes, you're always trying to save money and, you know, you work out with crappy toolboxes and on wooden benches and blah, yeah. blah, blah. And then eventually what, what I realized is that I spend a good chunk of my time, like 12 hours yesterday, I was in the workshop working on a, mm -hmm. on a rally bike, you know, and yeah. it's nice to have nice worktops, nice tools, nice setup, nice equipment yeah. to make it easy to do it. Like I've even, I never ever thought I would do this, but I've even bought myself a battery operated, um, like a ripper gun, you know, like a little uh, yeah, of course. gun for putting things like in an and out. An impact gun or a ratchet wrench. Yeah, mainly because I've got tendonitis from riding too much in my elbows and wrenching yeah. like this aggravates it. So yeah. now I've got myself a little gun just to take things out so it's quicker and easier. Sure. And I never thought I would, but you know, I would have probably thought, oh, it's expensive, 200 euros for a gun, but actually I use it all the time now. <laughs> Um, yeah. So, yeah. No, for me, it's. I think it's something that you build up over time, and as your, as your 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 skills increase, as your requirements, because you're able to do more and more things. I think I'm I'm spending a couple of thousand euros a year on this, yeah. and for me, it's still the best money because most of these yeah. tools you'll have forever. Yeah. And if you're working on your own bikes, you save some money. I'd always rather than take a bike or a car to a mechanic nowadays. I'd rather figure yeah. out the problem myself. If I have to yeah. spend some money on tools, because the next time I'm able to do it, I already have the tools, mm. I'm able to fix it. And, and it's something that brings me a lot of enjoyment. Yeah. Um, I think it's different than if you were just doing to break changes for other people's bikes, that would, that's something yeah. that would get very boring. But yeah. if you're, if you're have new challenges and different things that you're, that you're doing as you're building a bike or as you're, mm. where if you, you have to turn some parts on a lathe, you mm. might have to weld up some parts with something. You might have to bend some metal, whatever it is, yeah. or build an engine. It's all different skills. Yeah. And then it's something yeah. that I've really enjoyed learning more about and, and acquiring the tools as I go. Yeah. Cool. Good, good. Okay. Well, I think um, we'll probably move on. We've been going an hour now, so we'll probably move on to some questions yeah. and that'll bring out some more uh, interesting things. But thanks for giving us all uh, the big update on what's happened to Lucas sure. and uh, where we're at today. Um, so we're just going to start with questions from Patreon um, because, yeah. as everybody knows, the Patrons are the guys that fund these uh, things and allow me to be able to do all these podcasts and video episodes and things. So uh, we'll do them and we'll mm -hmm. go on to Facebook and Instagram. Um, uh, so the first one is from uh, Ben Lucerelli and he was saying, uh, well, some people might not know this, but while discussing choice to bring Lucas on and is extreme, so we'll just explain to people what that is, but back in, when yep. was it, 2012, 2012, 2012. Um, yep. you did a project called Andy's Moto Extreme with Walter Kolbach yep. and uh, Barton Churchill, where you yes. rode Husserberg 570s uh, to the world yep. altitude record. 
um, which was yeah. another cool, cool story. And this Ben is asking, um, when you did that, uh, it was mentioned that you had a, a military background. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Mm-hmm. Um, well, basically in Austria, we still have, have a military, mandatory military service. Um, you can either go into the military or go into civil service, but every um, every young man has to do it after after high school, basically, when you're 18, 19 years old. Um, and normally you can you can decide what you want to do. You can you can volunteer for certain positions. So we have a special, it's a special forces unit, basically, that you can volunteer. If you sign up for a year, you can decide what unit you want to go into. So this is what I did is because I knew I didn't want to be a military truck driver or doing something yeah. in logistics <clears throat> or or having having a post in somewhere like a bureaucratic post or something. So I wanted to get get in on some action. So mm-hmm. I signed up for the service um, and and you basically you learn a lot. You have a lot of outdoor experience. You learn how to build an igloo. You have like a week in the Alps cool. and you have various trainings dealing with with uh, with military situations, but also you're. Yeah, you you in in since we're in Austria, you're going skiing, you're you're sleeping in an igloo you built yourself, you're sleeping in tents. So it was just for me, it was a good introduction to being pushed a bit to to the edge and seeing what the human body is capable, um, and, and doing the whole thing with with other people your age and and things pushing yourself to to things that you wouldn't do normally. It's not really it's not a full time thing. I did it for for eight months in when okay. I was 19 years old. So this was the background. I was not a not a not an actual active military career soldier yeah. signing up. I did this yeah. mandatory service, or I volunteered okay. for a bit longer. But but this was the, the background. Yeah. So if we didn't make it to Magadan in late September, like we did, uh, would have been okay because she'd have built us an igloo. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> for sleeping at night. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, That's we good. had some cold nights on that on that project that you mentioned so so andy's andy's moto extreme we did in 2012 luckily we had our friend barton churchill with us who was yeah it was somebody Mm. else that i met through through the adventure rider forum barton also rode around the world starting in europe and then going to magadan probably three two three years before us Uh um so we kind of followed in his footsteps walter also gave barton some tracks walter and barton met at my place because i I had them both sleep over at my place I, i put their bikes up in my garage as they were traveling walter came from magadan barton came from came from munich and was on the way into on the way to magadan um so so both ended up at my place exchanging plans working on the bike some and and we formed a friendship and this turned into this and this motor project where we basically had to go above 6200 meters which i think is maybe twenty thousand feet or so i'm not not sure of the exact number But we knew that we wanted to break this record, so we planned this whole project in Chile, and and we did manage to go up to six thousand three hundred sixty-three meters. It was yeah. on our Husaberg five seventies. Yeah. Nice, cool, cool. And people can read all about that on EDV Rider. Yeah. There's, yes, yeah. there there's a bunch of ride reports. If you Google it, you'll find some some plenty yeah. of ride reports and videos and, and photos. And these yeah, motor, we can, we can and these motor extreme. Here. Yeah, or I'll, I'll get some photos yeah. as well and put them in here. Um, so I think we've already mentioned if your military experience influenced your travel, uh, you know, learn how to build igloos and work with other people and all, it, it all, it all influences, yeah. um, your confidence in traveling for sure. Um, we've already covered what you've been up to since tra- traveling and also travel plans. So, uh, so we'll come on to the next one, um, from Clement Schiller. Uh, he said, uh, I'd love you to experience travelers to discuss long adventure trips versus home life commitments, especially if you've trans- uh, transitioned from a single traveler to a family man. That's for me, I guess. Um, yeah. It's, you know, we can probably talk a little bit about this. You already mentioned that you've uh, met a woman in your life and it's changed your perspective yeah. a little bit. Um, it definitely did for me meeting Camilla. And I get asked this question a lot, you know, do you not miss traveling, you know? and for me personally, having done everything that I did in the five years traveling that I did, I mean, I, I literally smashed everything that I wanted to do. You know, I did two Dakars, I did mm. a rally on every continent, I did all the traveling through all mm. the countries I wanted to travel. Like, even though I would love to go traveling again, the burning desire to go traveling is not there. Like, I did it, yeah. I ticked it off the list. And then since meeting Camilla and I have a home in a lovely place here in Spain now, which I love living here. I can ride every single day if I want to. Um, 
you know, I've got my new rally training school that I am busy with and I just, that there is a desire to do projects. So there's a couple more projects on the horizon, um, but they're definitely mm -hmm. going to be shorter projects because I don't need to go full-time travel anymore. I've got a family here yeah. and I've got a life outside of travel, which, which I'm happy with. Um, but definitely there's still a desire to do some projects and there's something coming. So that's how I feel about it, that, that there is no burning desire anymore to do a long distance travel thing because I did it. If I did it, I would do it a different way. Um, so I, mm -hmm. I definitely wouldn't go on a motorcycle again around the world, but I might, mm. I might sail around the world. I might do something different yeah. because it's a new challenge. So how do you feel about it? Very similar, I have to say. For me, at the time, it was, like you said, it was a burning desire. It was something that um, I, I had that plan for, for almost 10 years or something to do this, to, to do a long, long trip, maybe even around the world. Um, and at the time, it was my, my top uh, number one priority. I had, my, I had, I had finished a relationship. Um, I was in my probably 33. I had enough financial independence that I didn't need to worry about money so much for the, for the trip. I didn't own a home. I, I, I rented a place. I had I had all my stuff. So it was very easy. There were no commitments. It was very easy. And at the time, it was the one thing I wanted to do. So it was very easy to leave. And there were no second guessing whether it's the right thing to do. Now, if you're if you're more tied up into into real life and you have somebody at home that you love and you don't um, you don't um, have it as a number one priority for sure. I, I still enjoy traveling and I've actually done quite a bit of traveling before Corona, yeah. not so much on a motorcycle, but but other trips. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I will do again. But going off on the motorcycle, I don't see, for, for a long, long time, I don't see that happening for me either. Yeah. What I could see maybe is taking my girlfriend and, and doing something like a cool converted four by four, Toyota yeah. Land Cruiser and, and yeah. going on a, on a longer trip. I could, I could see that, mm -hmm. but it's something, if I travel, it's something I would want to share with her mm -hmm. and, yeah, and sure. do together. I think you, because you do make some, some, if you're with a partner, it's going to be very, very tough to, to, to just mm -hmm. go, go off for a long, long time without, without the damaging the relationship in some way. Yeah. So it's not something I'm keen on doing. It's and like you, Having traveled so much, I mean, it, for me, it was not five years, it was three years, it was 43 or 44 mm. countries. Um, so it was still a long, long time. I've, uh, it's I've seen a lot and, yeah. it, and the, the burning desire goes goes down as you as you travel. I've, I cool. didn't quite have that feeling like you that I've really ticked all the boxes. So, it's for, yeah. so for example, for me, finishing finishing South America would be something that I, that I eventually want to do, but maybe I'll do it in a four by four with my girlfriend. I could see that happening. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. And, no, and smaller think... projects where you're going away for a few weeks and whether it's in Europe or flying to places yeah. like you, this, this would definitely happen again. Yeah. And I know like having a woman or a partner in your life that can support yeah. what you want to do. Like Camilla knows that I'm an adventurous person and she knows one mm. day I'm going to say, Hey, I've got this two month project that I want to do. I'm going to be away for yeah. two months. I know she would just say, go for it, go for it. You know, yeah. like enjoy yourself. And likewise, she says to me, Hey, I need to go away for three weeks. Fine. You know, we support each other with yeah. what we want to do. And she knows that I won't take the piss. She, she knows that I just do what I need to do to create good content and enjoy myself uh, and support my business as well. So cool. Yeah. Um, next one I'm going to miss out cause I've already covered it. Um, uh, we've already covered what happened to Patricia uh, <laughs> on, on the on the ban road. So Elaine Labelle said on the ban road, all those water crossings. How did you not get foot rot, <laughs> trench foot? It's an interesting point actually yeah. because we spent days totally wet yeah. through, like feet soaked. Yeah. Um, but neither of us got bad feet. I mean, of course they get a bit wrinkly and and funny looking, but <laughs> they 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 stayed good. And I think. A lot of it is to do with like, we always, when, when we'd finished going through the water, we always took our boots off, emptied them out, wringed all the water out so that the water's not just sitting on your foot the whole time. And then yeah. you effectively end up with damp socks instead of totally sodden yeah. feet. And then on the night time, drying them out, not, not sleeping in wet socks and putting dry clothes on on the night time. And it seemed to work pretty well for us. Yeah. I have my motocross boots, basically they let the water in straight away. So I think if they let the water in, they also kind of let it out. And you do, what also makes a difference is the temperature. So on the BAM road, the weather is very cold. 
So I don't think it's the same as having bacteria cannot grow the same way they would in a jungle. If you're walking in a jungle in some hiking boots and your your feet are wet, it's probably also quite different for your feet yeah. if they are so soaking wet the whole time. But when we were on the BAM in these places, it was not an issue. I mean, you you basically, like you said, you have wrinkly feet permanently because yeah. you're always wet from the water crossings. But yeah. it was just not an issue. It's not something if you dried them out at night, it seemed like it went fine. Yeah. And the next question was about drowning the bike. We've talked about that a little bit, but I imagine yes. you, know, you have to bring several oil changes to get it going again. Well, actually, we didn't carry oil for oil changes. If you got water in your oil, you got water in your oil and you just had to ride with that water in the oil until you found some fresh oil to change the bike. We didn't carry enough oil for an oil change. Well, other than when you needed to carry about six liters to get to a full tank of fuel. Yeah. But, but generally... Yes. The, if you get water in your oil, you get water in your oil. I mean, if you drop your bike in a river, you've got to pick it up as quick as possible to stop water getting in there. Mm. Um, but inevitably, if you get a bit in and 10% of your oil is water, it'll just mix itself up until you get to the next oil change. So uh, that's, yeah. how we, that's how we dealt with it. Um, a lot of people, when I put this out, Lucas, that you were coming on, the podcast said that the races to places seasons, the early seasons on the, the Bam yeah. Road and, and the old summer road were some of the best of races to places. And I have to agree, they were pretty funny. We had some, we had some good times yeah. going through there. No, they were. Um, no, also in terms of scenery, I have to say, having traveled so much, I do think as a European, this should be where you go because it's it's safe to travel. Like people are yeah. friendly. It's not really, nobody really wants anything from you. I, th I feel like in yeah. other countries, for yeah. example, in Africa, it's very hard to travel undisturbed without people expecting so much from you the whole time, and yeah. and wanting wanting something wanting something from you basically. And this we didn't have yeah. in in Asia at all. So easy, Asia, just not Asia, an issue. so easy to travel compared to Africa. Where did yeah. Africa last? Uh, I think if I'd have done Africa first, I might have been a little bit put off <laughs> traveling. Um, yeah. But because I'd had so yeah. much good experience around the world, you know, it was it was great. Um, yeah. Next one's from James Houston about spare spare parts. Um, with you having a rally replica as well, uh, did you have a full set of spare parts or did you share them? Well, actually, you did have most of the stuff yourself, um, but maybe a couple yeah. of things we we just shared and as we needed them. Like I remember rocker arms, we might have borrowed a set off each other now and again, but um, pretty much we haven't enough to be self-sufficient because we did travel alone. Um, so yeah. even I remember even when in Tajikistan when your state failed, um, you know, because of the visa situation, I carried on because I had a different visa yeah. date. So I just carried on alone and you carried on alone. We met up later. So, um, yeah. I think on a long trip where you might have to split up, it, it definitely makes sense to carry your own spare so that you're able yeah. to fix things without needing yeah. the other person there. Because there is, like you said, in Tajikistan, I would have been completely stuck if I didn't have my spare. Mm. You were two, three days ahead of me and to yeah. just ride back is, is not an option because you, your visa ran out. You wouldn't have yeah. been able to no. get another visa. Yeah. So I think becoming self-sufficient is very good unless mm -hmm. you travel maybe for two weeks in a group. You're going to Africa, you have a support yeah. vehicle, then it makes sense to, to take some spares for the whole group and, and share them. But if there is a chance of you splitting up like you do when you travel, I think you should be self-sufficient and carry your own spares. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so next one question, um, to, to probably from Jonathan, uh, adventure travel, uh, we've already talked about adventure travel impacted your life <laughs> in more ways than one. Um, uh, three, three reasons to encourage other people to go traveling. I think we've covered it all. I mean, <laughs> we've already talked about it so much about how, it, it changes you as an individual um, and it gives you so much more um, different ways of looking at life and different experiences. And for me personally, after five years traveling, I definitely became a better person. You know, in terms of helping mm -hmm. other people, supporting other people, um, being more a little bit more thoughtful towards other people, even my family, um, I felt that I've mm -hmm. definitely changed as a person. I would, I would agree for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just a question for Lucas next one Robert Katz uh, what's the story of Lucas we've already covered that um, uh, from Austria and we've covered pretty much our background where you come from and history and education and everything um, <laughs> I didn't actually see this one Rod Ronald says um, 
what's it like to have travelled with Lyndon <laughs> and having him stop all the time in order to get the shot? I'll let you answer that one, Lucas. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because well, you were on the receiving the end is, of races it, to places, kind of. Yeah, I wasn't in some ways, but at the same time, it was just not really an issue. Because the good thing is Linden is such a fast rider that normally you you went ahead fast enough that you, that you're able to set everything up. I catch up to you, and by that time you've taken your shot and and you're ready to go on again. I mean there were certain scenes where we wanted to have both bikes riding, like driving by, the camera fails, the camera falls over, the camera doesn't record, battery runs out, whatever it is. It 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 it's clearly not as easy. Like I have, but I didn't. For me, it didn't impact me as much. I have to say it, um, having traveled with you as a content creator, I have tremendous respect, like how much work it is to mm. to edit all these things, to set up the shot every time, to take all these times, because I know that it takes hours of your day every time. And it is yeah. like work. It's not like something enjoy setting up a camera or driving by the camera five times to get that perfect action shot or something. So it yeah. takes a lot of a lot of time to put out this to put out this content and be able to share it with other people. It's not fun and games, yeah. and it's and it's a lot easier to do it like me, where you're just doing whatever you want and you're completely free and you're you're enjoying yourself. Um, it it gives you a lot more freedom versus having to do the, the what you did. It's it's actually work, yeah. um, and and it's something that you have to be very conscious about whether you want to do it or not. It's not like you're going to yeah. do this a little bit on the side and then have have great content. It just doesn't I, happen. It's a very I conscious think effort. That's a really good point is that you you either do it, commit to it and give it 100% mm. and make an excellent job of it mm. or you end up with nothing because people yeah. that try to do it a little bit, it doesn't piece together well and it doesn't look good and the people don't want to watch it. Yeah. So you've got to make that conscious decision to do it. I mean, to be honest, riding through a river crossing three times to get a photo or a video is, is not it's not exciting, especially no, when not so first, <laughs> no, for especially sure when you especially when you ride through the river clean feet up, and then yeah. you think, oh, that would make a yeah. really great video shot. So you ride back through, you, you set the camera up, you ride back through, and then on the way back, you fall in the river and get wet. Like yes. that's that's a sort of thing yes. that, you, that happens to make cool content, and unfortunately, it's, yeah. you have to take the rough with this move. So. Um, yeah. Okay, next one's about maintenance. I'm just going to briefly run through this. Um, it comes from Thomas Becker, and he asked about how many, I presume it means air filters, did you take with you on average? How long did you change them? How long could you hold on to an air filter? So this really is a, I'll answer it, but it's like, it really depends on how you're riding. Because if you're riding with somebody else and you're riding in the dust all the time, then if your air filter's going to be blocked in two or three days, you know? Um, yeah. If you ride alone and you don't ride in traffic and dust and you're not in dusty areas, like it can last a month, an air filter. And I've yeah. left air filters a month. Um, if I need to clean them on the road, I find some diesel, I wash the air filter oil out and then I buy some air filter oil and oil it again and carry on going. Or if I'm a KTM dealer and they've got a filter, I'll just buy a new one. It's I think me and you both carried a couple of filters, so we had like two or three filters mm -hmm. at least to cycle. And then when we got to a, um, a built-up area, a city where there's a dealer where you can buy all the product, clean them and prepare them again so that you can carry on and you've got filters for another two or three months traveling. So uh, it, yeah. really wasn't, it really wasn't an issue. And as for bike maintenance and changing the oil, my, you know, I always stretched it out to the maximum, like 10,000 kilometers for an oil change, because when you're riding three and 400 kilometers a day, sometimes 700 kilometers a day, you don't want to be changing your oil every two weeks. Like it, it just becomes mm -hmm. a pain. So uh, we always stretched it out to the, to the maximum, I think, unless we actually had to change it. Um, and and also I think and having the infrastructure like if you come to a town where there where there normally you will find some motor shops everywhere so if there is a town and you know that that it's going to be a while until you hit the next town you might yeah. just do it there just yeah. to get it done yeah. and for example the oil filters you'll carry a, a bunch of pre-oil filters so you're ready yeah. to swap them in and if yeah. you need to then you can clean them because you can find some diesel everywhere you might yeah. even carry a small bottle of oil filter oil otherwise this is yeah. also something that's almost in every city in the world yeah. you can find it where they'll have motorbikes. Yeah. So it's not and something that is super tricky to, yeah. to have. And things like oil filters and fuel filters, I always carried two or three sets of those. Some always, they're only yeah. lightweight. You can stash them somewhere on the bike. Yeah. And 
Um, but his last question is, what else did you carry? And I'm not going to explain everything, but what I am going to say uh, to Thomas is, Thomas, go and do a search on YouTube for what Lyndon carries on Basil Bike, because there's a whole video mm -hmm. about 40 minutes long about everything that I carried on Basil Bike. Tools, spare parts, equipment, oils and lubricants, tubes, whatever, it's all in there. Uh, go and look at that video and I'll put a link to it in this uh, in this podcast as well, in the video podcast on YouTube. Okay, so that's the Patreon questions done. Just uh, whisk through the last few, which is from Instagram and Facebook. Um, really good question here, Lucas, uh, from Wheezy Riders. What would you do differently if you set out on a similarly long and extensive trip now? besides COVID. So if you set off again to do a three year trip, what would you do differently in the, in the beginning? Other than get the I right I think bike? I would, I would <laughs> like, it, well, I wouldn't do it differently. I would 100% make sure that the really tough parts where I wanted to do adventurous things like Road of Bones and Tajikistan and, and Mongolia to riding these wild tracks, I would try to team up with somebody like you that, that has a similar preference for challenging routes and that ideally is a self-sufficient mechanic um mm -hmm. and because these things i do i'm afraid to do them to, that i would not having had the, the experience of what can happen when you ride alone i would be careful and conscious about this mm -hmm. i would definitely like you said before carry an inreach on my person and one on the bike because there is a good mm -hmm. chance that you might be separated for the bike but there is also a chance that if you crash and you go tumbling into the rocks you, <clears> you <throat> break whatever you have on you as a person yeah so that you want to have have redundancy on the on the safety side, if you cannot cannot ride with a second person. Um, other than this, honestly, there is not many things that I that I think I did wrong on the trip that I would do differently. I would maybe like you, I would uh, start writing a diary just to have something where you're constantly reflecting a bit, taking a few maybe five ten minutes every night, every morning, just to reflect on on things that are going well, what you want to do differently, mm -hmm. what you've learned. To, to give it some more time to, for things to think in because you are always busy with just basically figuring out where you're going to go next, where you're going to sleep, what you're going to eat, yeah. what you want to see. And it's, and it's, it's sometimes it's, it's easy to forget that, that, uh, that you take some, some, some time to, to actually let everything sink in and not just get caught up by this mm -hmm. daily, by the daily routine of, of, of traveling, but rather, yeah. Just yeah, just enjoying where you are at the moment, what you've seen, what you've experienced, and, and yeah. trying to grow a bit more specifically from that from that experience. Good, good. Um, Small bear on a bike asks. Uh, you said, "Yeah, Lucas is back." Questions on dealing with life. Well, <laughs> we've dealt. We've talked a lot about you know home life and what we do in our home life in our workshops and you yeah. dealing with your accident and everything. But um, one thing that i just like to say, and you can say a few words after Lucas, but uh, for me, staying positive throughout all situations has been one of the most important things on my travels and my home life, in my business life. Um, you know, mm. COVID, COVID, Brexit, all this stuff going on, it's a disaster. Mm. And in some situations like for business, and you can get yourself all wound up about it and you can get really frustrated about it or you can stay positive about it. You can say it is a situation, yeah. it's not going to change. Uh, what can I do? What can I look at doing to make it better and keep pushing forwards and staying positive? That's what I've, I would say, like trying to make yourself stay positive throughout these situations, any situation is one of the most important things. And I have a, I have a partner that really helps me to do that. And she's very much the same. Mm. Everything's going to be okay. We'll, you know, we're going to do this, everything's going to be fine, always staying positive. And when you talk positive and you think positive, typically the results are positive. So, 100% agree. I think this is also what made us a great match, great match in terms of traveling mm -hmm. is that this whole attitude of wanting to face adversity, go staying, staying fun and positive and relaxed about it and getting through things. And this is 100% what got me through my accident without much I never felt even close to anything depressed, even after the sixth operation when I was back on crutches after two years, four mm. months. I mean, it was a pain in the ass, but at the end of the day, I still have my leg. I was pretty confident that it would that we would grow back together. Um, and I just used this time to focus on work, to to focus on on enjoying the time I'm with my family. So yeah. this is something that I really always always try to tell myself is to 
to focus on the things you can do. So during during COVID, I just used the time to spend more time in the garage. I read more books. I, I did some courses on things I wanted to do. Um, I just make the best of it. There, there was like I know that it's a pain in the ass for everybody, yeah. but <clears throat> for most of us. I mean, if you're stuck in a very, very small place with small children, mm-hmm. you, you're trying to combine work with, with children. I do appreciate that it's a very different situation. Mm-hmm. Luckily, um, I don't. I'm, I live in, in, in Western Europe. Uh, Austria is not as badly affected. We have a great health system, so I'm, I'm very lucky and of being born here. It's not something mm-hmm. that I, that I, that I, that I um, um, worked hard for. It, but I'm, I'm born here, so I'm from just yeah. from this. My, my basic situation very differently. But still, even around me, there are some people that are complaining, mm-hmm. and I always think to myself, look, if you had seen that family. Yeah. Or most of those families in in other in poor countries that would they would give everything they have to just have a tenth of what you have, mm-hmm. and you're here complaining that you that you have to be more in your 200 square meter apartment mm-hmm. or whatever it is. Um, yeah. It's it's it gives you a lot of different appreciation of what we have. Just being able to have a hot shower every day, to have a warm me- meal yeah. in your fridge, not wondering where you're gonna get get food from. Mm-hmm. It it puts things in a very different perspective. Um, yeah. If you've seen what other people live through every day, yeah, but sure. we're in in Europe and in the US especially, you really I think most people listen to this podcast. They're in a they're in a position where they can take the time to listen to things, where they have access to the internet, they have access to food, to yeah. to all the good things that that are important to have a easy happy life. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not much of a complainer either. I'm, I'm yeah. very grateful for where I am and, yeah. and also the experiences that I've had. One thing that I, I've took great pleasure in doing a couple of things where, uh, I met somebody on my travels, they took the effort to stay in touch, even if they didn't speak the same language very well through WhatsApp or whatever, yeah. and then something cropped yeah. up and they needed some help or something. And I've managed to help other people that I met on my travels that helped me. And that's like really mm. rewarding when you do that. And to think like, you know, yeah, okay, but I don't really need that. I can help that person with it. That's how I changed. Yeah. You know, I, I became where I want to help other people more and that's, that's really great yeah. and it's rewarding. So. Um, I think once you've experienced that generosity from other people, mm-hmm. it makes you see see what a great place the world is and, and how 95% of the people or whatever it is are good people. And both of us had so few bad experiences. Like yeah. I've, I've never had to pay one bribe crossing 43 countries. No, I've, never, yeah. I've never... I've I've never been robbed. I've I've had a pickpocket once that came into my yeah. hotel room and stole some money mm-hmm. from my pocket. But I mean, considering how far and how long I traveled and, and mm. what what most people at home would think, all the bad stuff that would happen to exactly. you, it's just not true. If you're going out with a positive attitude, mm-hmm. if you're friendly to people, um, like people around the world are friendly almost everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, ninety nine point nine percent. Like everywhere you go, yeah. And the saying that I heard on my travels, you know, a lot of people saying, "I oh, come to my home," and you know, I felt like I was eating them out of house and home and taking everything from them. And they always said to me, "My home is your home," and that's absolutely yeah. true now with my home. You know, like anybody mm. can come stay here. If there's a traveler, if there's someone on a motorcycle traveling through the village and they need help, like it's like the first yeah. thing that I do is like come stay at mine. You know, come here and mm. it's it's really changed how we are and it's that that network if it keeps growing and people just keep doing the same the world would be a better place you know if everyone helped each other um no i've I'll made some the... great great friendships this way yeah i'll have the next one in just because it's kind of cool um it, you've already discussed uh exactly what happened to you but uh, sam lambie mm-hmm. said that she met your cousin paco is that right mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah I, Paco told me the story that, that somebody, that my, my cousin Paco and his girlfriend, they actually bought one of these converted 4x4 Toyota Land Cruisers. Yeah. Um, and they were going to do a round the world trip. The problem was they started, I think, at the end of 2019. So, so yeah. they had about two, three months until Corona badly affected all the world. But yeah. they met uh, they met some people, and one of them happened. Somehow he he he, uh, he followed Paco. They exchanged Instagram and uh, accounts, and Paco told him his last name was like, "Wow, I I know this other guy, Lucas. Um, I've been following him. He was also on a bike." Yeah. So they ran into each other. I think in Oaxaca, in Mexico. He, he Paco told me about this and sent me a picture. Uh, so it's fun how the world is connected through 
through these online friendships and following various people. And if you share a common interest, like traveling, motorcycling, whatever it is, then then people find each other all around the world, for sure. Yeah, yeah. good. Moving on, there's just a few more left. One from uh, Mike Welkin. He joined the R2P watch party late uh, and he found us in 2020. Yeah. Has watched all the episodes, uh, really liked the ones that you were in, Lucas. Enjoyed it when you popped back in. Uh, but more importantly, the question at the end is, will you travel together again? And would, would Lucas ever consider doing Dakar or Africa Eco Rally? Um, when I was on the trip, um, having having talked with you so much and spending these nights at, when we were camping, talking about your experiences doing the Dakar um, and learning so much, it was definitely on my bucket list saying, I'm going to have to do this. Um, the accident sort of changed things again and, and being being on crutches so long and, and, and not being able to know if I'm ever, ever able to walk again and do other sports. It's changed my outlook quite a bit. And I know that Dakar is a, is a, it's, it's not just one of the hardest things you can do, but it's also inherently very, very dangerous because of the sleep deprivation that you have racing every day. I mean, I saw, I remember seeing these videos of you who I know to be an incredibly strong person and not once on the trip was there ever a mental breakdown in any way. It was just ever, okay, whatever, we're going to do this. And then yeah. I remember seeing these videos of you where you're just yeah. so sleep deprived. And I mean, this is what they do to yeah. people to, to when they wanna when they wanna um, when I wanna uh, punish them, sleep deprivation and combined with a very very hard physical and mental mentally challenging because you have to navigate at the same time as you have to find your way you have to look down figure out where you have to go it's really really tough and there is yeah. a lot of it's a lot of danger that that I'm not sure I want to take because riding the Dakar routes you might have the same physical challenge but maybe you're not going to do it in a very very when you're completely tired state like you have mm. after racing for 10 days for 14 15 16 hours a day sleeping 3 hours a night and the sleep deprivation accumulating i think there's a lot of inherent danger that i'm i'm very conscious about and i'm in and i'm not sure if it's a risk i want to take Mm -hmm. um, I think something like you're doing now. If I've, um, I've I've seen these posts that you've made online, where you're basically taking people on these roads, mm -hmm. so you kind of have the same riding experience, you have the same challenges, but you don't have to do it after yes. sleeping for three hours. You can try to get a decent night's sleep, so mm -hmm. that you're fully mentally present and you're and you're basically eliminating some of the risk that I think is very that it's worth eliminating. It's the same for me. I I love climbing. But I would like free solo where you're climbing without the rope. It's it's I can understand it that some people want it, but it's not a risk that I would take. I would want mm -hmm. to have the same physical challenge, maybe climbing the same route. But yeah. I don't really for myself. I value my life and and being yeah. around people and all the other things I want to experience more than I value this extra kick you get mm -hmm. from climbing without the rope. I would not do it. And it's the same with racing. It's yeah. it's tough and it's at the moment it's not a risk I would want to take. It's really interesting how many people that we've had contact us about the new rally experience mm -hmm. uh, with Lyndon Poskett Racing because you, it, the whole thing, it, it, is an ex, it is a rally. It's a rally simulation. It's yeah. everything the same as a rally without the competition. Um, so mm -hmm. if you want to stop and take a photograph, you can. If you want to do 40, if you don't want to push to 120 kilometers an hour, you want to stick at 80 kilometers an hour, you can. There's no, no. there's no pressure from competition or timing. And for sure, we get people come in that want to race their mates and finish before their mates. Mm. And there's still an element of that, but it, you don't have to. Mm. If you come on your own, you can just enjoy it and enjoy the scenery. Someone looks after you and you've got a hotel to stay in every night and there's a backup crew behind you following you the whole way, that kind of thing. So yeah. um, I think it, it is appealing to, you know, it is a small market, but there's a certain number of people that don't want the risk and mm. dangers of racing they want to go and just enjoy the scenery and that's another thing when i'm racing i never look at the scenery you know and no, now definitely now, I've not. Been, now i've been doing the rally experience i've had a lot more time to enjoy the scenery and i really value that so um mm. it's, it's good and the other question was uh, will, will we travel again together who knows <laughs> who knows i would say might... that we have we've discussed it we've we've talked about doing mm. maybe something in europe and and yeah. 
I mean, every time we did ride together, it was a fantastic time because we're such a good match in terms of our outlook and yeah. and complementary. You you were more on the mechanical side. I was good with 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 languages and sorting visas and with Apple. And with Apple, both not Apple products and Apple. I'm your tech. If I'm your tech support. That's true. If there was a yeah. problem with the computer or the phone or anything, Lucas was the tech that support, which I really missed on races yeah. to places when I went on my own. That's true. But to be honest, I learned so much from him in the four or five months that we were traveling together that I've pretty much figured it out myself a lot. But I still message you now and say, hey, what's the best app to do this with? I watch. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it's good. Good to have people, yeah. good to travel with someone with complementary skills for sure. So, Yeah, who knows? We'll, we might do something again together in the future. There's, there's plenty more time for that uh, once these corona yeah. times are over. And the last two really I just left in last two because they're uh, friends that helped you uh, and I also met one of them. Uh, so just mm -hmm. mentioned Mark Richards, uh, I believe he built, he built your engine at his place in Japan, is that right? I did. <laughs> yes, so, so, so um, there was some, I met, I, I knew somebody through through the Adventure Rider Forum called called Jen and he introduced me to Mark and Mark is a is a is a British expert living living in Japan that had a very small like everything in Japan is but extremely nice it was a two guy garage and it was mm -hmm. built into a professional workshop so everything was space optimized he had a thick welding bench that would fold down when his car was not in um, he had a small lathe and he really made a small space into a very workable area and, and basically yeah. he told me look you can you can do this here my bike was burning more oil than it was using fuel <laughs> So we, I knew I had to completely rebuild it from the ground up. I changed pistons, cylinders, the gearbox problem. Yeah. And Mark, Mark gave me his garage and and basically helped me out a lot because he's also a good, good mechanic. And and uh, together with some other friends of of Mark's from Tokyo, we we rebuilt the engine in his garage. It was my first engine rebuilt. Yeah. Um, and I I rode that bike for another. I'm not sure how long, but but basically all across Southeast yeah. Asia. Um, <clears throat> All across North America, and then into back into Central AS, actually all the way to um, another place in San Diego, mm. where another friend of ours, Kirk Zurbriggen, yeah. um, another a good friend that that I think you even bought a bike from him at some point. Yeah. Um, I found that I found an engine cheaply on eBay, and I knew that I was still I still was planning to do another fifty to hundred thousand kilometers, and I bought a, a low mile uh, engine, and I thought mm. instead of rebuilding the current engine I have. Um, I mean, it was running great, but I I had that plan yeah. to oh, if I'm gonna ride another hundred thousand kilometers, who knows? Yeah. I I bought a cheap engine on eBay, and and Kirk kindly offered his garage and his yeah. his living room and and his couch, and I ended up staying quite a bit longer than than I thought <laughs> in the beginning. But I was able to swap the engine in in his garage. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I also yeah. slept on I also slept on his couch, uh, Kirk. So thanks yeah. for that, Kirk. <laughs> uh, thanks, cool. Kirk and Mark and all the other people mm. we've met, the fantastic people that that walked yeah. them into welcomed us into their homes and their garages without any without respecting anything in return that there's been yeah. some a lot of a lot of fantastically genuine uh, kind Absolutely. and generous people out there and you mentioned earlier about writing a, a diary you know or keeping a track of everything and I did I wrote like nearly 300,000 yeah. words in a diary well, and the one, one thing that well. I really one thing that I really regret not doing was writing everyone's yeah. name down <laughs> I'd, yeah. I read about, oh, I stayed at this awesome woman's house, you know, and I just didn't write yeah. a name down. And so it's like, if I knew a name, I could probably reach out on Facebook or Instagram and maybe try and find them, you know. Um, and when I've been writing my book, I've been finding all these times where I wish I did this. And like you said, writing down mm. how you feel and how you could, mm. what things you'd like to improve. I didn't do that. I just wrote what yeah. I did and what I saw and who I did things with. And I didn't focus on some of the things I, I learned from writing my diary after reading it now, what yeah. I should have done. <laughs> so it's always, yeah. it's always the same. So yeah, cool. Well, that's, uh, we're nearly, we're nearly two hours, an hour and 45 and that's gone really fast. Um, I think it's been Good. really great, great having you on and, uh, thanks for sharing your story, Lucas. Um, of course. All the questions that people have put in. Thanks to everyone for submitting the questions. Uh, this is going to be the next podcast that goes out uh, on all the podcast platforms. That's an interesting one, actually. People have been asking me, can we get it on Apple? Can we get it on here? Yeah, it should be available mm. on all platforms. Um, it just takes a few days to get out um, from the day we edited it. So the first thing that I will do is I'll edit it into a video and I'll put it out on my YouTube, but for Patreons only. So, so I'll put it out on Patreon for Patreons only. 
Um, and then after a period of time, I'll put it out publicly on YouTube and all the podcast platforms for everybody to listen to. So um, great having you, Lucas. And uh, I hope that we see each other again very soon. I'm planning to do Erzberg this year. So maybe we can Fantastic. meet up. Maybe, maybe we can meet up while I'm in Austria in a few months' time. I think it's about 100 days away yeah, definitely. now. Definitely. Yeah, I'll definitely come join you again and, and see what crazy bike and trip you're going to do it on this time. I've seen you ride it on an electric bike. I've seen you ride it on a big rally bike. Let's see what, what uh, think, um, crazy I, I, idea you can have. I think everybody knows that it's going to be a 302 stroke. Like I've been desperate okay. to do it on a 302 stroke and I've been training on a 302 stroke. So um, okay. I really want to go back and do it on a two stroke. So I'm hoping it happens. I think things are a little bit unstable still with COVID. So um yeah i don't know what the situation is going to be like in austria in three months time but we'll see keep fingers crossed and, and hopefully it'll be back on yeah awesome thanks a lot lucas thanks for having me it was good to take, catch up and, and give take, everybody an update on what i've been up to yeah take care and everybody um let us know what you think put your comments in the description below uh, i'll put some <laughs> pictures and video i'll put some pictures and video links throughout this uh uh, the YouTube edit of the podcast and uh, yeah, enjoy it. Cheers, Lucas. Good to see you, man. Bye-bye. Cheers. Ciao. Bye. Bye.